All right, welcome uh, to the American Enterprise Institute, um, to both our audience here and our audience at home behind those cameras. Um, I uh, thank you all for coming, and um, I'm going to talk for about 25 seconds to introduce our uh, panelists and uh, uh, speakers. The Innovation Illusion, available for purchase right outside um, and um, for uh, autographing uh, right after the event at that beautiful, mysterious black table we have there uh, to my right. Um, Frederick is going to uh, open the event uh, with, uh, say, five to ten minutes of, of remarks about the book for those of you who have not read it, after which we will have a discussion um, with the two authors uh, Tyler Cowan of George Mason University and my uh, colleague James Pathakoukas about the book itself and about um, uh, economic dynamism, innovation, and the, uh, the future of uh, uh, capitalism. Um, and with that, I'm going to ask um, Frederick to come up here and address all of you. All right, thank you very much. Um, can, can everyone hear me? Is the sound system on? Okay, very good. Um, well, thank you, Stan, and in his absence, um, Dalibor uh, Rohak, for inviting Bjorn and Meek to, uh, to come here to the AI and present uh, our book today. And also thanks to Tyler and Jim, who kindly agreed um, to join us uh, on this panel um, uh, to talk about not just their book, of course, but uh, some of their great writings on the subject as well. It is about a couple of months now since Bjorn and I released this book, The Innovation Illusion, How So Little Is Created by So Many Working So Hard. And when we've been sort of touring around mostly in Europe and been speaking to a lot of different audiences, corporate audiences, universities, uh, policymakers, there's one thing which has really surprised me. And that is how angry people become when I talk about one of the main themes of the book. People getting visibly angry, or at least irritated. And that's when I'm saying that, sort of, despite appearances, we are not living in the most innovative age ever. And that seems to be a very strong belief on, among a lot of people. And of course, it's very easy to, to see why, because sort of when you follow the, um, the business press or when you read uh, up on many of the fantastic things that are going on in universities, in science labs, uh, in high-tech companies around the world, it is, of course, very easy to be impressed by the technological development. And it's also easy to get the sense that we are if not living in the most innovative age ever, at least on the threshold of such an age, and that we are going to enter an economy and a world where our main concern is not going to be how on earth we're going to spark some life into the Western economy, where the main concern rather is going to be how can we protect workers, companies, perhaps investors and others from the ruthless consequences of innovation and rapid change in our economy. So the theme of the book is really about this illusion that on the one hand, we have this idea, this almost fantasy about our current age, which is that it's almost running amok, that things are moving so fast that we don't have time to adjust our social system, our labor markets to the speed of technological change. So that's one of the perceptions. But the other perception is that we need to have policy responses to slow things down, to make technological change and innovation uh, to move even slower than we argue in this book uh, it's moving. Behind our thesis, stands a very, very simple idea, which is that innovation itself isn't about input to the economy. It, it isn't really about what type of technology that you use as input in order to produce. It isn't about the amount of money that being spent by businesses or governments on R&D or development projects or whatever they would call them. 
Innovation is really about what happens in firms and markets. It's about how you can progress real change that we're going to start to do something different from what we were doing yesterday or before that. Innovation is really about that old uh, capitalism mechanism or the perennial gale of creative destruction that Joseph Schomte wrote about in the 1940s in his perennial book on, on capitalism. And the argument that we're making in the book is that the Western world, which is North America and Western Europe, have, it's gradually be declining its capacity to foster rapid innovation for the past 40, 50 years. And that's not because we think the input factors are bad or, or that they are not as impressive as they were before. In fact, we are not qualified to make such judgments. Our basic argument, our basic theme of the book is that the declining pace of innovation in the economy rests with changes in the way that our economy works. That our economy today have reduced the space for those factors that lead to rapid change in firms and markets. We can see this in a number of different economic indicators. One thing which I think is pretty obvious these days, there was a debate about it a few years ago, is that the productivity growth of North America and Western Europe is less than impressive. And while there have been shifts over time where, for instance, in America, you saw an increase in productivity growth in the late 1990s and early noughties on the back of rapid uh, ICT investment in the economy. Over time, there has been a gradual decline in our economy's capacity to add more productivity to the economy for every year. If you look at Europe, for instance, Western Europe, uh, a good rule of thumb is that since the 1970s, the early 1970s, we have shaved off roughly one percentage point of productivity growth for each decade. So we started off, off in the 1970s with about four percentage uh, productivity growth in Western Europe. 1980s to three percent, 1990s to two percent, noughties to one percent, and that leads us to basically where we are right now, which is very close to zero when you look at Europe as an average. Now, the debate, of course, is that there may be a lot of mismeasurement of productivity growth, not just of productivity growth, but a lot of different indicators that uh, may not be equipped to capture all uh, activities that happens in the economy uh, these days. And of course, that's true. I mean, it's always been the case that the economic aggregates that we're working with are not perfectly uh, equipped in order to capture all the exciting things that happens in the economy. But the argument we're making in the book is that it's simply uh, impossible, uh, almost mathematically, but also from other points of view, that we would be mismeasuring our pace of, of productivity growth to such an extent that sort of the decline that we've seen over the past, uh, uh, not just couple of, not, not over the past decades, but more recently, uh, that uh, it doesn't really capture all the exciting things that have been happening in the digital economy. It would have been easier to accept that thesis if we have seen many other aggregates pointing in the right direction. If we, for instance, had seen that business investment growth had been sterling, well, then it could have been sort of a, a, an indication that something may have been perhaps fundamentally wrong with our uh, capacities to record in national accounts the pace of change in the economy. But we're seeing a business investment development where growth in investment spending gradually has been decreasing as well. Not just in recent times because of the crisis, but we've seen this development over several decades. We've seen that real R&D spending growth in the business sector also have uh, declined over time. We've seen that the patterns of corporate borrowing has changed in the sense that while corporates and the corporate sector is still borrowing a lot of money, it has over time became a net contributor to the economy with its savings. That the corporate sector today, uh, in contrast to the idea of capitalism, which of course is that you have uh, innovators with brilliant ideas but little money and they need to go to financiers in order to get money in order to uh, to make them real or to 
invest in them. But for the corporate sector as a whole, in both Europe and America, we see that it's adding more savings to the economy rather than it's using savings from other parts of the, the sector. We're seeing that sort of the trends of dividends and share buybacks have over time been um, moving in a direction where it's perfectly obvious that companies today rather try to take money out of corporations and, and invest uh, uh, much less in them than they did in the past. So this is the type of change in capitalism that we are trying to describe in this book. And what we, the argument we're trying to make is that we have almost returned to an old style rentier form of capitalism where we have investors or capitalists that are increasingly occupied with having a stable and predictable return on the investments rather than having investors that are uh, guided by their animal spirits and trying to uh, chase for different sort of, of enterprises and endeavors uh, to re really break new ground. We're pointing to four factors uh, in this book which tries to explain why we have seen this change in the capitalist system. One relates very directly to capitalism and has to do with capitalists the fact that one of the biggest change we've seen in the Western economy over the past 50 years is the almost uh, extinction of the capitalists. Uh, I mean, I know that argument works better in Europe because America has always had more capitalists than Europe. Uh, but over time, what we've seen is a gradual takeover of corporate America and corporate Europe by financial institutions that are managing other people's money. And the money that they are managing tends to be people, uh, money uh, from people that are saving for the retirement and with increasing number of people in or close to retirement and with huge demographic shifts between old and young people in many societies, it means that an increasing part of these investments are reflecting the invest investments and savings profiles of people uh, that are getting old. Uh, I'm getting old too, so I don't have any sort of argument against uh, the logic that you actually want to outsource the management or your savings to someone else, because I do that too. It's perfectly rational that we use financial institutions in order to generate a better return on our savings. But the simple point that we are making in, in this book is that these type of, of institutions take to make, tend to make different judgment calls of what type of companies it want to invest in and what these companies should have as investment profile. One of the effects, for instance, is that you can see that companies with uh, um, uh, sort of significant shareholding dominance by, by financial institutions tend to have own investments that are having much shorter uh, life cycles. They tend to want to invest in, in, in things that generate a return in the short term rather than things that tend to generate a return over the medium term or the long term. So we have that as a first fact that a change in capitalism where capitalists have become increasingly absent in the management of companies. A second development is corporate bureaucratization that an increasing number of companies are very large entities um, which behave almost as government entities in the instinct in trying to over organ organize many different things and to bureaucratize things. And that creates a culture where you take away some of the entrepreneurial uh, instincts that tend to have dominated in these companies before. A third factor connects with globalization <coughs> and the fact that globalization has changed um, many uh, markets around the world, partly sort of in, 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 in different ways. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of globalization. I want to see more of it, but I think we uh, can see a couple of trends in globalizations where sort of with the fast, sort of the era of fast trade and investment growth from say uh, the 1960s going up to the late 1980s, early 1990s, led to a lot more contestability of markets where you had multinational coming in that didn't exist in these markets before and started to compete with local incumbents. They came with new technology, management experience, uh, competitive instincts that led to um, uh, a lot of dynamism in, 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 in many markets. But over time, we've seen that globalization has partly changed face in the sense that what we have now is uh, a lot of multinational companies that are 
outsourcing different uh, parts of the value chains and the supply chains to others. They are positioning themselves much closer to their end customers. They are putting a lot more investments into trying to control competition on their end customers' markets. And while they accept the idea of having a lot of sort of competitive rivalry throughout the value chain in order to get a good sort of position for themselves, they are increasingly skilled at taking away competition from the markets where themselves operate. The last factor we're talking about is about regulation and the change regulations that we've seen in the Western world over the past couple of decades. While we had a trend going up to the late 1990s with increasing economic freedom in most parts of the Western world, that trend hasn't been around us since then. For the past 15 years or so, we've seen a gradual increase in the restrictiveness of uh, how governments regulate markets, what type of regulations they have, and how easy it is to step in and out in markets in order to compete. That isn't the most critical part of what we're trying to point to um, uh, in the book. The most critical part is that the quality of regulation has changed in the sense that we have moved from uh, a culture that at least until some decades ago was based on having regulations that were easy to understand and being fairly predictable to having regulations that are increasingly complex. They are almost impossible to understand for anyone who tried to work with them. And sometimes this complexities or even sort of opaqueness of regulations is intentional. It's because a collapse in the regulation-making process where the sort of increasing number of participants there wants to confuse things. They want to respond to an increasing complex world by making regulations complex. And we see a lot of that here in America. We see a lot of that, of that in Europe in the sense that we have, to take one example, um, in Europe something called the precautionary principle, which is a regulatory principle which uh, guides a lot of environmental regulations and other type of regulations as well, but where it's just impossible to say what the consequences of a precautionary principle is going to be. Uh, and what we've seen on, on, on a, sort of a growing number of examples in Europe is that while a rational interpretation of precautionary principle leads you to have a very accepting, abrasive idea of rapid innovation and rapid change. It's mostly used in order to stop things, to stop innovators or companies from experimenting and testing things. And that, of course, affects many of those companies that wants to be at the frontier of technological change and productivity change. Because if you are working with stuff which is new, which hasn't been regulated before, and you're confronted with stuff like precautionary principles, then of course what the regula regulation will do is to increase the general degree of uncertainty uh, that you have in your own enterprise. If you're trying to break something new, to develop sort of new technologies for something that didn't exist, of course you're confronted with uh, a commercial uncertainty which sometimes can be very, very large. And if you add to that regulatory uncertainty, you will find that uh, the reality almost becomes prohibitive for those that actually wants to go out and break new grounds. So that's the book for you. We have an ending chapter where we sort of increase our pessimism even more, where we say that uh, <laughs> capitalism is not going to get better. Um, it is possible to change, but uh, I want you to buy the book and read the end chapter before <laughs> I'm going to tell you what's in there. So thank you. Thank you very much. I think optimism is what people, you know, <laughs> may have may have hoped for. Um, but but thank you very much. I do. Uh, I would recommend that you uh, that you that you buy the book. Um, you know, it gets you depressed. It, it, James Patrick Cook is actually pretty happy. I think as he was reading it, uh, you know, as he saw the world crumbling, is that sign? It's very weird preferences. It was a life changing experience, yeah. for the better or worse. I <laughs> That's right. Um, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to have a panel discussion and then um, in maybe 45 minutes or so we'll, we'll open it up to the, uh, to the floor. So what I want to uh, do first is I want to talk to, I want to uh, turn to Tarek Cowan who has, I think, strong views on uh, some of the issues we discussed here. And um, uh, Tyler, what do, you, what do you think? Are we doomed in this age of late gray capitalism? Uh, did we just eat the low-hanging fruit or is it? 
uh, or, 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 do none of, or do neither of those two apply anymore? I have two books where I put forward a, a version of the author's thesis. One is The Great Stagnation, the other is The Complacent Class. But a bit like John Cleese in the Argument Clinic skit, my sense is if I'm a commentator, I should try to build the most convincing case for an alternative and more optimistic point of view. So let me put this out there, but with the complete disclaimer, this is a deliberately opposing stance and not exactly what I think. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we are doomed. But if, if we were to make the case for the present day, I would start with the notion of invisible innovation. So one of the invisible innovations we have is simply how many more people believe in peace? So they might be willing to support some kind of antiseptic drone strike, but especially in Europe, but even here in the United States, loyalty toward the idea of peace is much higher than even, say, in the 1960s. And if you look at broader human history, one would have thought this is impossible. And yet, to a considerable extent, we have achieved it. It doesn't show up in GDP. In some ways, GDP may mislead us, because GDP counts wartime expenditures as GDP. Uh, so in a sense, more GDP is peaceful GDP, and the option value on avoiding a war to me seems a lot higher. I also think we're a much more tolerant society, different kinds of minorities, racial issues, uh, people who are gay, people who are, are different in all kinds of ways. They have it much better today. Now, some of this may improve GDP or productivity stats, but a lot of it is just that you know people are happy because they're tolerated more readily. I would say libertarians are tolerated more readily than used to be the case. <laughs> uh, makes us a bit happier. We don't have more influence, you may have noticed. <laughs> but nonetheless, we're tolerated, and here we all are everywhere but in academia, of course. We're tolerated more. <laughs> Another set of invisible gains, I think, come from matching. So I think it's at least plausible that people make better marriages than before, or they have a greater ability not to marry if they don't want to. So you know, fewer women are hit. Or, or beat, for instance. But also, you look at the music market. So when I was a kid, like you'd buy an album, and you'd be surprised when you put it on, and half the time there were only two songs you liked, and then you would sort of shelve it somewhere and put one of them on a mixtape, and that would be pretty wasteful. Today, what we spend on music, it's actually much lower than it was in the 1990s, much lower. Uh, but almost every cut people buy, they've heard in advance, or it's been recommended, or it's passed through various filters. So the rate of satisfaction is much higher. So I think in many areas, collectibles is the most obvious, music, marriage. Just matching is far more potent. Again, some of this may be picked up in GDP figures, but I think a lot of it is not. It makes our lives happier. Uh, old age is a lot better. Uh, I'll let you know when I get there. But I recall when I was a kid, you'd meet some guy. He was 60. You'd think, like, he looks like hell. <laughs> And you don't see that so much today. You know, some of it's medical care, and some of that is in GDP. But I actually don't think that's the main thing. I think a lot of it is norms and peer effects and expectations, people exercising more, simply having the sense like 70s is the new 60, or 80s is the new whatever, 80 is the new. So people, when they're older, they seem a lot more mobile. They travel much, much more, I think, above and beyond what income effects would predict. They don't you know, look like hell anymore or to a much lower degree. Uh, so just like we're more peaceful, we somehow have this new conception of old age, which is a fantastic innovation. It's invisible as an innovation. Not all of that is counted in GDP. Maybe our biggest innovation is helping the rest of the world to develop. So again, you go back to the 70s. Paul Ehrlich says, population bomb, the rest of the world will collapse, famine, whatever. Uh, mostly that hasn't happened. China would be the star example, but really many, many other emerging economies with billions so a huge innovation we've had is our ability to extend our managerial reach so that it helps emerging economies. I don't mean to take credit away from Chinese Indians for what they themselves have done, but they've done it with really a huge assist from the West in terms of information technology, how they think about management, just how they think about progress. So making those ideas portable, which we were terrible at in the 60s and 70s, we're now, it seems, massively good at. Now, admittedly, that doesn't help us much, right? Uh, so you could say, well, you know, growth within America, it hasn't helped the Rust Belt much or hasn't helped every part of West Virginia. But still, that doesn't mean we're not innovative. We have this phenomenal innovation spreading out some of our good stuff to other parts of the world. It's been very, very, very good for billions of people. 
it's a way of reframing some of what has happened in terms of innovation. It's just they're not local ones, so other people gain. In some ways, it you know, may make some of the middle class here worse off. If you just think about lives, like what do you want for yourself? What do you want for kids? Like through your life, you want a pretty smooth profile of your happiness. I wish we could measure this. I've never seen a good paper on it. Just my anecdotal sense is right now, like people's happiness, maybe not the poorest, but it's a lot smoother than it used to be because of you know, various invisible innovations. Uh, we waste our attention much less. This is actually oppressive. Here I am with my iPad. I can check it before or after. I'm never wasting my attention. I stand in line. Who cares? I have a book. I have this. Text someone. Uh, maybe it's gone too far. Uh, still, it's a non-GDP thing that's really important. Like your attention is the ultimate scarcity, right? Your time, your you, your consciousness. We use that a lot better. So maybe we've just been taking this break from standard old style, let's have the flying car innovation. We've had like 30, 40 years of social and invisible innovations with, with hugely positive social impact. And we're now investing in all these things. They're just like hyped up BS media stories, but they will someday happen, like artificial intelligence, driverless cars, weird stuff in biotech. Not right around the corner, but we're taking this like 40-year pause, doing amazing things, some of them invisible, and we're going to climb right back on that horse and then have this further wave, Internet of Things, transform the world with a lot of innovation that right now is only hype in Atlantic Monthly articles, but they actually are at some point going to come. So let's be optimistic. We're not doomed. Everything's perfect. And thank you all for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Bjorn, what do you think? Well, I, I, I think taking 40 years pause is quite a long pause, and I think times really matters. Mm -hmm. And, and I, uh, I would like to add to Fredrik's comment on... on uh, there's this interesting... Every year since 1989, Sunday Times, the British tabloid, is, is presenting something called the Rich List. And it's the th thousand wealthiest people in living and working in Britain. And when you look at that list, you can find a lot of old money, and you will find finance, and I would never say you find also shady money, but some would say that. Um, I would. Uh, yes, he would. Um, <laughs> but what we do not find is entrepreneurs. We do not find the capitalists, as Frederick was talking about. They are not present in there. And there's a reason for it. We haven't had successful entrepreneurs in the vast numbers that we would like to. It reflects the 40 years that you were talking about. And it reflects also the fact that we have a financial economy really taking over in so many ways. If you were a Stanford graduate in the 90s, deciding to go into finance, you would own three times as much as anyone working in any other industry from your peers, which is in a way I think absurd because the financial economy was supposed to support the real economy, not to be the masters of the real economy, which we find today. Um, I think it's very important to look closely at what has happened with the corporate culture, a culture of corporate managerialism that we talk about, because of course change and innovation all come from what companies do. And companies has been trying the best they can to avoid uncertainty and to define everything about the future in quantifiable risks. That is trying to squeeze in the future into an Excel sheet. And I think by doing that, you might live under the impression that you are actually avoiding uh, risks and uncertainties, but in fact, you are creating an illusion about the future that is not really true, because you cannot really control the future. It's, it's, an, it's a fallacy to believe so. I think that we lack entrepreneurs inside companies. We have ejected them for bureaucrats running globalization, globalized companies. And it's a rational thing to do if you're, if you're increasing your business in terms of volumes. But it's not rational if you would like to see new innovations going into and, and being part of, of, of your, your, your development and your business development. And I think that co companies also is, is trying to avoid contestability and strategizing for something new. And instead, they plan and they plan and they plan. And if you ever would like to, if you're a young person today wanted to go into business, you should be a controlling officer. Because if you are a controlling officer, you can actually manage company almost like a, shade, uh, a shadow government because there's not a CEO in the world who will go against a corporate, uh, a corporate planner or a corporate control officer today. Because if they're doing something fails, then they are in big trouble. So I think that we're creating a certain system here that is it's not what capitalism was all about and i think it has to do with aspirations but i, I see that you, you so like if you no i you know no please the, so in in the book um there's some emphasis on the idea that there is plenty of research that is that has been carried out and technologies that had, on some conceptual level have been have been developed and you know are around the, th these are not the futuristic atlantic monthly uh <laughs> technologies uh, per se, 
it's so it seems hard to square a situation where these technologies exist, um, but but no one is taking advantage of them. But it's it it's not obvious to me how companies that, if I read the book correctly, are uh, throwing off cash like crazy. They're not really investing. Um, how they manage to effectively shield themselves from those new innovations, it, especially in a regulatory environment that you guys described as highly uncertain. Right? You'd think if, they, if, if the regulatory environment is constantly overthrown, there's, there are all these technologies that are you know, ready to be incorporated into day-to-day -day life. Why do you not see people use the, the combination of those two things? Right? Because we, because you, you'd expect the, the people to, who take advantage of, of those new technologies in an, in an uncertain regulatory environment to have at least a small chance of being wildly successful, right? If they, if they just luck out with the regulatory environment. No, but I think the, the, the main explanation for it, to, not to go in to make it too complex, is that there's this wide notion that innovations can win only by showing up. If you have a new technology, it will be obvious to anyone that this is a great technology. Well, the history is full of examples of, of great potentially great innovations that only stop in the, in the drawing board at some technique, uh, in engineering's place somewhere. It, it's, it's innovation needs, you need entrepreneurs that are enablers of those technologies to succeed. And you need to pedal through a lot of obstacles to be able to, to, to actually be successful as, as a business owner or as, a, as an entrepreneur, if you wish. Uh, and it's a very much more complex thing to succeed in business than just having a good technology. It's so much else to it. And, and if you, for instance, look at how much investors um, make sure that they have a good team that they invest in. The technology is one thing, but the team is almost more important today than the technology in itself. But shouldn't the, are, isn't the reason why we have the venture capital industry and private equity, isn't that exactly to exploit opportunities like that? Definitely, and they do so too. Uh, and and we're, we're not saying in the book that everything is it's a complete stasis. It, we don't think that. I mean, there are things happening, but not in the scale as it used to happen before. And so the pace is going down, and we're trying to understand and trying to explain our view of why that is a fact. And it's a combination of these four things that Frederick mentioned. So it's very important to see them all together. It's not just one thing. It's not just one big obstacle. We get rid of that, and then we can just move on. It's much more complex than that. Right. I mean, you, you sort of see these things as sort of self-reinforcing. I yes. mean, the, the fact that you have this you know, this, uh, this increase in regulation, then that, that puts a premium on hiring executives who, 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 will navigate, who will navigate the regulation rather than being risk takers, yeah. who, will, who will help to protect the company from regulatory uncertainty rather than, you know, venturing out into some new entity. So just those two things just as one example. So you see all these sort of pieces, you know, reinforcing each other and leading to a, a, a cautious capitalistic mechanism as opposed to a, a more entrepreneurial one. Yes. Yeah, just come in and sort of perhaps connect with also what Tyler said um, in terms of sort of the, the, the argument of the book is not that sort of life right now is miserable. Life right now is actually pretty good. I mean, my life is probably happier, funnier than if I would be been at this age in the 1960s, 1970s, uh, or any time before that. A lot that of air point. conditioning. You know, Sorry? A lot of air conditioning. <laughs> a lot of air conditioning, indeed. Indeed. I mean, sort of, I, you know, goes to sort of Tyler's book as well. I think he's absolutely right in terms of one of the great things with new technologies over the past decade, some of them a bit longer, is, is um, uh, our ability to match in a better way than we could before. Mm. Um, um, so I mean, I, I think I think that's sort of it's it's life right now is actually pretty good. Um, now the question is, is life becoming better at the same pace as it did before? Is life becoming more exciting, more challenging at the same t pace as it did before? Um, so I mean, I'll, you know, one of the pivotal moments I had sort of when I, I started to think in these terms for the book was a conversation I had with my old grandmother when sort of I was watching her a morning sort of she was doing her daily routine which is that she called around to 15 of her friends and asked sort of do you want to meet for lunch and she got a response and then she needed to call all people back that wanted to meet for lunch in order to 
organize the place where they're going to meet and the time they're going to meet. And that took uh, sort of a good three hours every morning. So I told her, you know, what you really should do, you should develop an app. You know, never mind that you're 95. You develop an app <laughs> and, and sort of you, you sort of connect with the friends and you can sort of just tune in and say, well, I'm, I'm free for lunch at 12.30 today. Shall we meet at that restaurant or that restaurant? And you sort of, you can get technology to organize the life for you. You don't need to go through this three-hour routine every morning. And she laughed at me and said, oh, yeah, yeah, so, sure, I'm, I'm going to develop an app. But then she told me, so... Frederick, I mean, I, 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 she told me, I, I know that you think my, my life is sort of, I'm living in a technological desert, but let me tell you one thing about you, she said. <laughs> I've been watching you now for 40 years. I've seen you sort of going through these different jobs. You've been working abroad, you've been studying abroad, and you think you've been doing so many fancy things. But you know, you know what, what, the one thing with you that really sticks out, you know what that is? No, I said, no, what is it? You're always doing exactly the same thing that you did before. You never change. What you do right now is exactly the same thing you did 20 years ago. And to some extent it's true. I mean, I've been changing jobs a few times in my life, but it's always sort of been in that vicinity of economic policy making. Um, and she told me sort of, when I was at your age, just imagine the different changes I have had in my life, which has forced me to do something different Sort of, I couldn't continue to do what I was doing the last year or sort of five or ten years before that. So sort of on a number of occasions that technology and other market events, not just forced events, but inspired to different changes in our life. And I thought to myself, good Lord, what an exciting life to live. Sort of being confronted with all these sorts of developments which basically throws you off course. You can't continue to do what you always have done. And I think that's, that's one of the things where... I have some problems with my own hypothesis of me living a very happy life. I, I, th I think I would have liked to have that excitement coming through faster technological capitalist change which had confronted we, me, me with new opportunities but also uh, new pressure that I had to change. And I think this is partly where we are right now where um, so to go to one of the theses in, or one of the observations in Tyler's book which is the the number of people who need to have antidepressants these days. And I, I, I mean, I've just been watching through my own sort of networks of friends and acquaintances, a number of people who complain about not being in control over their lives, who sort of needs to sort of go into yoga classes for a week every sort of year or half year that needs to go to mindfulness exercises and feel that sort of life is out of their control at the time sort of when they've perhaps never been in so much control of life as they've been before, where economic pressures are not very strong. I mean, they're not forced to change jobs very often. Many of them have sort of stayed for jobs for a very, very long time. But it's this perception that sort of life, rise, life right now is sort of, it's, it's so much happening, so we need to get back into, into that sort of control. And I think sort of that's where a lot of people will have problems right now with this sort of the happiness thesis about our own age, which is that they don't, they, in the first place, they don't see it that way, but it's that we have developed this psychology in the West that so much is happening and we need to get back in control. But what if most people don't want challenging lives? What they really want is peace and the kind of predictability both you and I have achieved. You can speak for yourself in a moment. <laughs> uh, and Peace is really required for that, but you can't just have global peace without having all of society be pacified and especially feminized. The striking truth about the last 30, 40 years, I think, is how much more feminine everything in society is. Ideas, leadership, influences, higher education. And this is pacifying. <coughs> and maybe it is a kind of package deal, and it's this one huge, incredible, unpriced happiness innovation, which is not in GDP. And we might like the technological dynamism and the happiness, but maybe we can't have it all. And the dynamism, keep in mind how intimately tied it has been to war in European history and the 20th century and atomic energy and you know airplanes and how many innovations really sprung from war or the Cold War. And we traded that in for this new, weird, strange, static bargain uh, that is perhaps mankind's greatest innovation. 
figuring out a way to slow down innovation to make you happier is something people in 1940 hadn't really conceived of and we've actually done it. And why isn't that just this big, fantastic thing? So it's, it's war. What isn't it good for, right? Yes, exactly. You get more innovation. Uh, Thomas Piketty says it reduces inequality. It solves a lot of but problems. But it's terrible for actual human lives. Right. Well, I mean, yeah. And we've made that trade off <laughs> for the better. Right, there's always a downside. So what, Jim, do you think, there's a, do, do, you, do you agree that we are, we are stuck in a place of no innovation, well, uh, but a lot of meditation? <laughs> <laughs> The meditation illusion. Uh, you know, what I, I think about my, I, I, my, I, I'm very active on Twitter, not so much Facebook, very much on Twitter. And I have, and you can, when you follow people, you can separate them out into different lists. And um, what's the happy list? The politics <laughs> one. <laughs> the, hap, the happy list last year is my uh, baseball Chicago Cubs list. <laughs> so, somewhat less happy this year, but. Uh, and I have, I have, so people who are sort of wa Washington policy people or economists, I have them all on one list, which I call my East, East Coast list. And then I have more of my technologists, venture capital people, Silicon Valley folks, they're in my West Coast list. So if I'm, if I, if I'm in a, a bad mood, I will look at the West Coast list because that's always about new innovations, new, in, in, uh, new products, it's, al it's always a very upbeat list. And then if, I'm, you know, if, I, if I need to bring myself down, then I'll look at the, 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 the Washington wonk economist list who, say, who, who write things that uh, uh, you know, productivity is low, the US economy is bad, all the jobs we're creating are bad, no one, no, no one is working. Uh, so it's two di very different worlds. And certainly if you talk to technologists from Silicon Valley, they roll their eyes uh, when uh, economists uh, talk about you know, the productivity figures, they tend not to believe them. I mean, it's amazing if Bill Gates... What did, what did I tell you? It's been only 20 years. We'll, we'll soon they, well, develop the, a secure the numbers, messaging The numbers app. are wrong. The numbers <laughs> are wrong. Also, be patient. Because we're, we're, because we're about to have a quantum, computers, uh, quantum computer app on our phone uh, any day now. And what's amazing is that you know, this event is about slow technological progress mm. and slow productivity. But yet you have one of the most you know, influential technologists of all time, Bill Gates, suggest... Well, maybe we should have a robot tax, mm. one to fund training for all the people who are about to lose their jobs, which everybody in Silicon Valley believes just about, that we're about to be hit by this massive technological, at least underemployment, not unemployment, but that we need this robot tax to slow, to slow things down. Things are moving so fast, we need to have government come in and have a tax just to give people more time to adjust. It's very much like uh, what some people say about trade that the, the opening to China uh, you know, it introduced this huge flood of people onto the market and we, we like trade, but maybe this all happened too fast and workers can't adjust. If you slow <laughs> things down, people can adjust. And maybe we need to slow down technology. Uh, so give, give all the truckers who are about to lose their jobs, give them time to sort of you know, adjust, eventually age out of the profession and it'll be a lot, lot easier. So there's this huge differential between what technologists think and what economists uh, like yourself think. So uh, why are the technologists mystified by the illusion? Well, but to give you an example, uh, so I was reading a few years ago this very good New York Times piece which sort of almost predicted the rise of Donald Trump or someone like that to sort of to capitalize on increasing anxiety with technology, was showing a map about America and, and listed the number one the most common profession in, in that particular state in America. How many people that were occupied in that profession? Um, and the most common profession across the states was you, you were a driver. You drive a truck, a bus, a taxi. Um, and the article continued to discuss about sort of the advent of uh, intelligent vehicles and how we're talking about a profession which is just going to be wiped out by technology in the future. Um, and this is going to create a very strong political reaction. The other day, the day after, someone sent me a press release from the American Trucker Association saying there is an acute shortage of 50,000 professional drivers in America and that shortage is going to grow up to roughly 175,000 in 10 years time. Okay, so I mean, how do you, how do you get these two different there are expectations about the future together. Well, one of them, of course, is one of the factors which is 
important here, of course, is demography. The fact that a lot of people that are occupied in many of these professions, they're going to retire. And you don't find very many young people that are willing to substitute them or to go into jobs where you uh, do a service like um, uh, transport or go into industry. And sort of when, when you go into many countries, I've, d I've done the same for a couple of European countries, just looking at sort of what, what are the sort of most typical jobs in different regions. Uh, and you're going to find, if you go to any sort of, uh, sort of employment agency, they're going to scream for people to come into that, that type of work because demography is, 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 is one of the things that are changing here. So I think it's, it's, there are a lot of different societal factors at play. And I, I mean, I, my line of argument is basically sort of that we can't afford to slow things down. We actually need to have technology much fast because in many of these typical professions, we, we can't find people to substitute all the work that was done before and the economic consequences. But do you think you're missing something the technologists see? And then to, to add another layer to, layer to it, um, you know, occasionally the Financial Times will run a piece looking at um, you know, the, the unicorns and you know, mm. the America's ability to generate these very fast growing technology companies. And uh, I always see that the, uh, in the comment section, it'll be from people in Europe, and they'll be like, they'll just bemoan uh, Europe's inability to create the startups, that they're unwilling to take risks, that too, there's too much regulation. Do you think, to the extent your diagnosis is correct, do you think it just applies a lot more, even though I realize the productivity numbers, but do you, do you think it just applies a lot more to Europe? Uh, than it does the United States, and it just doesn't fit as neatly with the U.S. I think that there's one thing we need to, to know about entrepreneurs, especially technological entrepreneurs, is that they will always sell you the story. And, and I haven't yet met any entrepreneur or any tech entrepreneur that hasn't been completely convinced that whatever they have is going to be the world's success, big success in the next two years. Right. Well, it seldom happens, but they're really in love with what they do, and they should be, and we, we want them to be. Uh, the thing is that what people tend to miss is the complexity of succeeding in business. It might s sound boring, but it really is a complex matter. And, uh, and for a consumer, you might see something and you use it, but what you see is an interface what, of something that is really complex underneath. Uh, and in terms also how you create the business around it, how you create a successful income model. If you look at many of the unicorns you mentioned, I'm very skeptical to many of the income models that they use. And, and the valuations today are, uh, I mean, it's not hard, hard to argue that the valuations are extremely high today. And, and I would like to see, let's go back in five to ten years to see how many. Well, you know, they say in Silicon Valley that, that we, te we tend to overestimate what we can do in two years, but we tend to underestimate what we can do in ten years. Maybe, maybe they'll pan out. Maybe, maybe, maybe we'll see. Selection, the, 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 their sector is dynamic and most other sectors right. aren't. And their sector is not as big as it feels to them out there in the Bay Area. And they're describing correctly what they see, and we're describing correctly what we see, and you add it all up, and growth is pretty slow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's how I would defend the thesis, what I've argued also myself. They're not wrong, but they're just seeing their bubble. But do you think that underestimates the spillovers from all these technologies? In, that we, we define them very narrowly. Okay, they're creating an app. Uh, there's, a new, there's an app uh, called Peanut, which allows um, moms to find other moms and you know and you know rather than not knowing other moms in your neighborhood you can go on this and you can find the other moms who have similar interests. Okay, Sounds that, like that, a nightmare. That's, that's, that's very you, look, you look at budgets you know people pay to live somewhere, right. health care, higher education, there aren't big spillovers, uh, big spillovers into this. Right, but they think perhaps we're underestimating that. Okay, that's just a very narrow Are you example. Are you talking about meetup.com? <laughs> 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 I don't know. I'm, I'm married. You can <laughs> you, you can go off on that yeah. tangent if you wish. Uh, but anyways, I just I just wonder again if they're, perhaps they're also seeing spillovers um, that we're we, we, we're tending to miss. So no, the, obviously the fact that they're there and when you go into you know they said Steve Jobs had this reality distortion field. Well, all the Silicon Valley there's a bit of a reality distortion field and, and a bubble that's certainly a valid. Point. DC too. We're you know way past. No, no, we're in touch with the people. <laughs> 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 they send their most representative um, <laughs> members here, and then we, we interact with them. Um, I, so I, 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 I'm sympathetic toward the, uh, the general view that innovation is fairly limited. And I, I very much enjoyed, um, uh, I think, chapter eight, the chapter on robots, yeah. and how they haven't you know, uh, done Captain anything. Yeah, robots. Yeah, no, yeah, that's, yeah exactly. Um, but so when I look at the sort of big factors you guys describe in, in that, that supposedly hamper innovation, 
um, and I'm going to leave, leave regulation on the side for a moment, you could envision a world where precisely the factors you guys describe are very effective at producing an innovation, right? So you have uh, a very stark separation of ownership and management. The, I think the typical way economists think about a separation like that is that the manager um, is fine if the, if the, if the firm um, uh, disappears, but he, enjoy, he gets the chance to enjoy reasonable amounts of the upside if the firm has, has drastic success. Um, you know, obviously, it depends on how you model these things, but there's no, I don't, there's no really clear reason why the manager would be super worried about, about downside risk. Um, you then have a corporate structure that is immune to price signals, right? So that should allow the manager to carry out whatever he does for quite some time uh, and put immense resources into projects um, without, without um, running into trouble. And then um, thirdly, you have these large investment funds that control the resources of tons of people. Um, many, many of them may be retirees, but presumably they invest sort of along the risk return frontier and they have the scope to both invest in risky projects and non-risky projects in a way that retirees 50 years ago did not have, right? Where they'd buy shares in utilities and they just get regular streams of dividends. So I, I have trouble understanding why a system set up that way, um, where there should be money flows that go to risky projects. There are owners who can, where there are managers who can uh, invest massive resources into them and who are uh, sort of shielded from the, the downside risk because they don't have as much equity at stake as they would in a different world. Why does that system not work? So what would you, Well, if you, for, where, where does it go so wrong? There's many things to say there, but yeah. one thing is that if you ever try to succeed with a, with a new venture, it's one thing that is of absolute importance. You need to have alignment of interest between your owners all the way down to the company. And that comes from understanding exactly what are we supposed to do. You need to line your troops. And if you have a situation where you don't really know who owns the company, you don't really know how the power structure behind that ownership plays out, then you might have a really good manager or you might have a really poor manager or whatever, but that manager will never be able to really understand or know exactly where and how to aim for. And one thing that usually happens then is that they don't step out of line. They try to be well within their boundaries. And, and uh, entrepreneurship, in its real sense, is to take, go into something that is uncertain. That might be, you, you don't know. You, 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 and you will never hear a manager that go and st st stand in front of a board and say, I would like to do that, but I'm not really sure what's going to happen when we do it. That manager is gone the next day, unless you have a very strong owner who decides that, yes, that's the ambition that we have. Those type of companies still exist, especially in, in, in the Valley. But in general speaking, they're very rare, and they were not rare 50 years ago. So that's just one. Alignment of interest is just one thing to, to, to say about that. I mean, just to add to that, I mean, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'm an economist. I, unlike Bjorn, I don't have any real experience of investing in companies or sort of, I'll leave that to a professional financial institutions that will manage my money and make sure that I sort of uh, going to reduce the Get your ca rents. capitalist instinct in, 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 in companies. But during the course of, of research for this book, which has taken several years, I've, I don't think I've ever come across so much bullshit in corporate governance theories in terms of how things are sort of in an abstract way going to work. Um, you have this notion sort of that you can separate different entities, owners from management, etc. But I think one of the very clear experiences that we have had over the past 50 years when the role of financial institutions in, in, in owing companies have become so much larger is that you can't separate them. And they, they don't want to be separated. It's just that sort of they, they just want to sort of outsize, outsource some type of managerial management behavior Otherwise, they want to have very, give very, very clear instructions to what management is going to do. And one of the things which have happened, of course, is that um, owners um, that are institutions, they don't like companies that retain a lot of earnings in the companies. They want that to be sort of basically paid out to, to, um, uh, to the owners and they don't like the idea of managers sitting around and having 
good access to internal capital. They want sort of if they want to finance something, they should go out on, on professional capital markets and get money there. And that sort of gradual over time has led to a situation right now where sort of many companies right now, in order to try to fund their own development, their own research, their own innovation um, for the future, they have to go to explain to capital markets what they want to do. And capital markets aren't equipped to do that. They don't understand sort of what innovation in a, in a sort of uh, electricity company in a health life science sector is. They, what they're good at is, is something completely different. So we have this steering coming. We have this steering coming through sort of a lot of guidelines being agreed from the owners of how the company is going to behave. And, the, and those guidelines sort of instruct very sort of predictable behavior from the management. So sort of there is a theory out there which is how things are supposed to work, but that's not how reality is. But so if, if publicly held firms are so, so terribly run in, in a variety of ways, then why don't we, maybe not within two years, but in 10 years, why don't privately held firms compete them away entirely? Well, they have to some extent. Yeah, and hopefully they will. Yeah. You know, even though I mostly agree with the authors on finance issues, I'm not so much of the same mind. And this is the real Tyler speaking again. I think if, you know, corporate savings are up, so if you want to fund from retained earnings, that's easier. The idea that all the money is flowing out of companies, you know, buybacks and dividends, if you properly adjust for new funds being raised, that's more or less at a historical norm, at least for the United States. And finance as a share of wealth in most countries is not really up. It's a higher share of GDP, but that's because the wealth to income ratio is rising. And finance is held pretty steady at about 2% of wealth. So I view most of the problems as resulting from various technological plateaus as having been reached. And I think if corporate governance mostly is having gotten better, there are fewer insiders picked, boards are more disciplined, they do their job more often than they used to. I just don't think that matters very much but I'm much less skeptical about corporate governance and finance, at least in the US. Europe can be different than I think the authors might be. No, and, and, I mean, I'm somewhat skeptical too, but uh, and, and why do we think that if, the, if, if, the, if these companies, if there were you know, fewer shareholder activists, for instance, which often gets brought up you know, with terms about short-termism, short that if they're not, if they're not uh, you know, using uh, corporate cash for uh, uh, dividends and stock buybacks, that they're going to use that money to create the next Bell Labs. I mean, that, I mean that's. I mean, there, I mean, there's a reason that the, that these companies all went through these convulsions in the 1980s because they were they were fat and happy and weren't subject to a lot of pressure, and they weren't they weren't particularly efficient. I mean, and and some degree isn't isn't their behavior somewhat rational? If you if you believe, if, gee, if they if they read, uh, you know, see what the CBO is saying or the Fed that we're that's going to be 1.8 percent growth forever, isn't it, isn't just plowing money back to shareholders is actually a very rational decision. Well, that's oh, the absolutely. thing. I mean, absolutely. absolutely. And, and they are showing but you're saying us they're the cause of that. One yeah, they're showing us what they believe about the future. They don't believe in a future with high growth. And that's what we're saying. That's what, I mean, that's the main problem we have. Right, but, but, but it's, it's, it's a perfectly a rational expectation. Problem. If everything's paid out in dividends and the rich people getting the dividends put it into a VC fund, I mean, my sense is current institutions don't stop money from getting to good projects. It's that just on the technological side, good projects are hard to come up with. Well, it's the definition of what is a good project. If you, if you, if you, add, if you, if you see what kind of definitions that are used, it's taking away a lot of opportunities in that they don't want to go into uncertainty and they, they would like to control whatever you do. So you don't take the type of, uh, of risk that you used to do. That's one of the explanations to it. I mean, is the equity premium changed? Like, what number mm. would that show up in where it's, like, testable? There's a lot of foreign capital, way more foreign capital than ever before. You can do things in Israel, have spillovers back here, do them in China. I'd just be surprised if either corporate organization or finance or the kind of cycle of fund investment, reinvestment, have accounted for very much, if any, of the productivity slowdown. I just think we had this huge wave of progress. We mixed fossil fuels and powerful machines. We did everything we could with that. That was tremendous, rapid growth, changed our grandma's lives. We can't do much more with that, and we're stuck. We're waiting for the next thing. Mm. And, it's a kind of, and then plus we regulate too much. So I have much more of a brute force understanding of what happened, and much less of a corporate financial set of issues compared to what I think you two are saying. Mm. So the argument is basically sort of that 
it doesn't really matter whether sort of you have institutions as owner or if you have private capitalists as owner, sort of the result is going to be roughly the same I in terms so. of... I think so. After right. frictions, you know, one is lower transactions costs, but growth, you know, your growth is going to be the same in the medium term, I think. And we're just stuck. It's like hard to fix traffic. It's hard to build a, a real safe flying car. It's hard to get to Mars. People hate nuclear power. It's hard to have batteries good enough so that solar works. Eventually, maybe yes, but it's hard. Right. I mean, unless the manager, you know, is the founder. I mean, that I think that matters a lot, and that's what people in Silicon Valley we always say it makes a big difference if it's if it's the founder managing or they or they move on to what they'll call. Um, you know, kind of, you know, more, 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 more PR uh, CEOs who worry about things like marketing, communications, rather than being the guys who founded the company. I mean, I think that, that matters a lot, but should we ever expect big established companies to be the ones really doing, I mean, obviously they do a lot of innovation, uh, but I mean, we're, we're going to depend on, on, on new companies, not just starting, but growing, growing big. And we, st we still seem to be able to do that, maybe not as well as we could, but we are, we are still doing that, at least in this country. Keep in mind, manufacturing, innovate, manufacturing productivity is fine. It's just a small part of the economy, and government, education, and healthcare are kind of train wrecks. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. Those aren't even typically corporations that are governed. They're just like horrible, misshapen institutions <laughs> that we fear and resent in varying combinations. And you sort of wish, you know, some big elephantine bureaucracy corporation like General Motors could get its hands on them. But we're not even at that. Yeah, it doesn't seem like we're half a year away from robots playing a significant role in the healthcare industry. Uh, or so like they want you to think. I mean, they do already. Like Bill Gates says, tax the robots. Right. Microsoft Word is a robot. How many typists have lost no, their I, jobs? Oh, I mean, like, legit. But they're not the, going to look like the ones in the movies that Jim Harry likes. has in movies. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. No. I mean, any software is a robot. And in that sense, Age of Robots is here. It's just not I that I just want to have a room yet. without people in it. But That's they why. accelerate information <laughs> flows. They don't yeah. kind of make physical things happen very effectively. But shouldn't we hope that your theory that we're just, this is a pause, is a, a pause and then which then the innovation and it's all going to rev up again, progress will rev up and maybe we'll see that in the statistics. Don't we, shouldn't we hope that's the case because um, the part of your book which, may, which I think you meant to be the uplifting part but <laughs> to me is actually the, the gloomiest part is that if you accept, if you accept the diagnosis and uh, your, your general, you know, how you survey the landscape, sort of the, the policy fixes part just seemed to me to be inadequate against these headwinds of, of demographics and globalization and financialization. And then, well, here's what we can do. They just seem to me to be, they would be overwhelmed. And what, maybe at some marginal way they would make a difference. I mean, do you, do, were you satisfied with the solutions, the policy solutions that you came up with? Which I think were good ones. I just, I think probably almost all of them are probably really good ideas. I just wonder if they're enough. People hate what we want to do, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And I, I can say I hated writing that chapter. We, sort of, we, we, we didn't have it uh, when we handed in the manuscript. And the only reason we actually wrote it and, and, and had some ideas about it was because it's the, the publisher wanted it and thought <laughs> right, sort of right. it's, if, if, it's if, you put, if, you, if you put it in there, sort of you're going to get more journalists to write about you because they're going, that's the thing they can criticize. So it's, it's and correct. That, that turned out to be true. <laughs> Absolutely correct. Well done. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I mean, I mean you, can, you can look at this in different ways. I mean, um, I mean, one of the great things about globalizations over the past 30 years is how you have converged a lot of uh, countries to sort of getting closer to sort of the western frontier of technology, um, productivity. Um, uh, similarly, um, we've had sort of larger companies stepping in in more markets and uh, sort of taking over where you previously had sort of local firms running a shop or sort of the local gym or... So shouldn't that lead uh, to much more innovation when everyone is on the technological frontier and it's Well, absolutely, it, it does. I mean, it, it, it raises productivity and mm. I think it's been a fantastic development and I think there is a, some easy low-hanging fruits to be picked. I mean, if you go to a country like Italy, which we write about in the book, I mean, I think there's an obvious solution to how they can fairly quickly try to raise productivity, which is to sort of converge a lot of small and medium-sized companies um, which are under severe technological restrictions. So many of these restrictions 
uh, come because there are labor laws and other things which prevent companies from becoming larger and sort of incorporate technology, incorporate uh, new management, etc. Uh, but I think you can sort of you can you can even look at areas like healthcare, education, a few others, um, where we have seen negative productivity um, over you know, a pretty long time for many countries that. Well, even if I'm skeptical to the idea that a lot of things are going to change in them, at least there are great possibilities to do that by fairly simple means. You don't need to have sort of automated technology for surgeons, so you don't need to uh, sort of uh, have a lot of fantastic development in, in sort of genomics or other fields of, 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 of science in order to generate a boom in these sectors. It's just about sort of incorporating normal management practices from other parts of the economy and that in itself is going to be fairly uplifting. Um, so there are, so I mean, I think there are sort of a lot of these things that, that, that can be done in order to increase the dynamism of our economy. Where I'm more skeptical about is this uh, notion that sort of given broad developments we have with high concentration rates on markets, with sort of uh, big incumbency dominance on many markets that that it's going to be easy for new firms coming up with venture capital money with new technology to contest these markets. I think we can point to a lot of examples over the past decades where we had sort of, you know, Facebook or Google or many yeah, others. So would you break them up? I mean, are you a, are you a break up big tech, you know, Google, Apple, no, Facebook, I'm I'm, Microsoft, I'm, I'm, Amazon? I'm not. I mean, I, and I don't think they are the problem. I think these companies are actually right now a source of optimism in the sense that I hope they can go in and challenge incumbents in many other different sectors where we haven't seen see, so much isn't, change. But isn't that exactly like the European-American difference where from the European perspective you're like, these, 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 they're bringing competition, they're going to shake things up. Yep. Where in this country you have op-eds in the New York Times saying uh, not, you know, that, they're, that, right, that no one can compete with these companies, they have, they have all the data and they're causing income inequality. So while you're viewing it, or you're viewing them as sort of competition catalysts in Europe, in, yeah. in this country you have folks, usually progressives, who are viewing them as competition killers. Wasn't it the same debate here about IBM? Right. And Microsoft, but they're not typical of Europe. I mean, right. like Germany on the tech companies, <laughs> it's pretty awful. In parts of France. No, but I mean, it's, it's like th that, that debate is, is, is kind of a, it, it's a, you could, ha you could argue about intervention Long, I mean, if you have a very, very long-term trend and something is really, but I think that the, what we will see in those sectors are a lot of new types of companies coming up, and it's going to be, it's going to look very different a few years from now. Oh, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, one thing I'm m much more concerned about. I don't. In, I'm not in favor of, of sort of governments stepping in either by regulation or competi competition authorities to try to think, change things, but. What I think is more damaging to the contestability <laughs> of markets and to sort of the normal mechanics of competition is to go into many other markets which are at least nominally open to competition but where you've basically had large multinationals positioning themselves very close to customers having sort of patterns of oligopolistic or monopolistic competition and where they through contracts basically controls the entire value and supply chain so if you come up with a brilliant new technology, you can get the money in order to begin, to begin to do things in terms of getting to the market. It's going to be virtually impossible because the large incumbent is going to dominate input production and so much more that you need to have in order to go into the market and compete. But you can't do it because these suppliers have, have restrictions, contractual restrictions to actually work with you. How optimistic are you too about Chinese innovation? <laughs> Which I'm I, pretty uh, optimistic about. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm more than more than I would think, sort of given the broad politics of the country. I mean, I, I sort of I've I've seen too much of the five-year mentality, sort of five-year plan mentality inside Chinese corporations, in a sense that sort of they are under pressure to deliver results from the innovation plans, sort of for the next five years when they're going to change jobs. But one thing that really makes me optimistic is is sort of Chinese people, the go-getting spirit, the aspiration of actually wanting to change things and see that it is, is actually to change the sort of the material outcome of your life by being entrepreneurial and being innovative. And I think this is one area where I think there are big differences between uh, 
sort of the general culture in China today and many other Asian countries uh, too, compared to Europe, compared to North America, in the sense that sort of I find I come across more exciting Chinese that sort of think there is a Klondike out there and they want to take sort of go out yeah. and sort of dig dig gold. Um, Sometimes they're successful, sometimes they fail miserably, but sort of you have that spirit there, and I think that makes me optimistic. On, on the other hand, yeah, I, I agree to that, but on the other hand, they, are, they too have to work and live in an environment. Mm -hmm. That is the Chinese culture when it comes to these issues, and I, I'm not so sure that you will find those uh, really positive individuals, but I'm not so sure that the society as a whole and the economic system as a whole will be as adaptive or, or understanding to big change. <laughs> On that uh, additional optimistic note, uh, let's turn to the audience to uh, see what their thoughts are. Let's go here in the middle. Please wait for the mic. Um, please introduce yourself briefly. Uh, ideally, end your question with a question mark. You know, those things. <laughs> uh, my name is Anders Sjöström at, uh, at the Atlantic Council. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting but. It reminds me very much of John Kenneth uh, Galbraith, the new industrial state that came out in 1967. Then it was uh, the big car companies that were the Google, Apple, and Amazon. The, and everything looked as if it would just go on like this forever. Then came the oil crisis, Schumacher's small is beautiful, the Reagan revolution, mm. the high-tech revolution, and the retail revolution, and the uh, finance revolution, and everything changed. So when I hear a thesis like this, it sounds perfect, but uh, uh, how will it break? 3D uh, printing is something that uh, requires a decentralization, and the sheer obnoxiousness of these big companies is also something to break. We are now seeing Ubers, uh, and generally uh, it's uh, the Silicon Valley which is now getting uh, uh, the, the heat. Uh, where do you see the main weaknesses? I forgot to mention McKinsey as one of uh, the main weaknesses. You mentioned the bureaucracy of uh, the companies, which is very much the management consulting company. What is the weakness? Thank you. Sh shall we? Respond directly. Yes, please. Oh, okay, all right. Well, I mean, I, I, I sort of when I was doing research for the book, I actually reread uh, the New Industrial State by John Kenneth Galbraith, and I thought to myself, sort of, I mean, he, this is a guy who is wrong on so many different sort of issues, but what he described, sort of, in terms of corporate America, was, in my view, sort of a perfect description of what I see today in terms of sort of how a very sort of engineering idea about how to run grand companies and sort of the mixing of government and, 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 and business, etc. Um, it's, it's very, very strong similarities there. Um, I mean, I, I, I think sort of there are lots of fantastic things that have happened, uh, especially uh, in the 1980s and 1990s in many of the sectors that you mentioned, finance, uh, technology, etc. I hope we can do a lot more of them in future in terms of deregulation, creating opportunities um, for more competition and more change. Um, I think, however, that what these decades also did, at least 70s and 80s, was to, in a fairly easy way, uh, try to generate the type of growth which was good, but it also cover up, cover up for the fact that we had sort of not very many companies that were willing to be very, very innovative. I mean, they, they, they sort of could compete in different way, and they could create a lot of economic output by, by sort of just by doing something uh, uh, different in terms of, of of how they behaved on markets. Um, now that sort of after a while, that sort of period also ended because they had exhausted many of the new opportunities that came came through that. I think it's roughly the same with globalization more generally. That so we've had a couple of decades where more trade, more investments have generated um, a lot of good things in the economy, more dynamism. Um, but we're now at a point sort of where it's difficult to squeeze much more out of it um, in terms of changing how Western economies are going to behave. And I, I struggle sort of to see um, how we could replicate sort of the, the development from the 70s, well, at least part of the 70s, the 1980s, and 1990s in terms of 
finding ways to cover up for the fact that the underlying innovative instinct of many of a good part of the corporate sector isn't very strong. We can't sort of add so much more capital to the economy as we did since the 19, 1970s. It's not that sort of we don't have a lot of untapped female, female um, uh, a lot of workers. people work this sort of that sort of that are outside the labor market that we can put put into the labor market and generate growth in that way. There's not a new China on the doorstep of the global economy, which easily can sort of connect us to an uh, sort of untapped labor reserve, which is also going to sort of generate a lot of positive things for our economy. So we're basically back to sort of hoping that a lot of these technologies are going to make a change. And I'm, 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 I'm really hoping for 3D printing or a lot of the other stuff that we're talking about, that they can provide opportunities for uh, real change in the economy. But, but at least for the time being, I'm not seeing that that change is happening at the speed which is going to be, sort of make a material difference for America or Europe. Hopefully we are at sort of the point where, which Tyler talks about, that we have sort of gone up to plateau, now we're trying to create sort of an opportunities um, to go even further in terms of technological development. I'm not capable of making that judgment call because I simply can't, I, you know, I can't predict what sort of iterations that technology is going to have in the future or what the capacity of intelligent vehicles or automation is to really change the uh, the, the dynamics of, of the corporate sector. I hope we're going to go in that direction, but I'll, I'll, I'll still like to see it before but, I want to I mean, it. just comment, I mean, if you, for instance, look at Germany today, the rate of automation is too slow, uh, given the demographic development and, and the aging population. They need to wrap it up quickly. And many countries are in that position. So we need new technology much faster than we have and we get it today. And, and, and that's a much bigger problem. We're not even discussing that today because we're on the other end of this, this solution. <laughs> 3D printing, I'm very skeptical about. You know, all it does is save you the price of a UPS delivery. Let's have someone else's factory make it and ship it in. There's a few things, like in surgery, you need yeah. it right now, but I don't think 3D printing will ever be a big thing. It'll be a small marginal improvement, which is fine, but we already have manufacturing. That's all 3D printing is. You still need, you still need UPS to deliver the thing you put into the printer. Sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, let's go all the way on the left here. Hi, uh, John Mattel, Virginia Tree Farmer. There's one thing I think that uh, a big sink for productivity is, uh, is environment. And uh, 30 years ago, for example, we used to cut trees and we made a mess. Now we don't. And so uh, we've become sustainable in the last 30 years. And so the soil's better, the wildlife's better, the water's better, all these things are better, but they're never measured. And we don't want to measure them. They're unmeasurable maybe in the, in, the, in the value of the economy, but they're real and they're important. And so, uh, yeah, as you say about life has gotten better, and it has, but we've also gotten sustainable in many mm -hmm. factors, and that's not measured. So I, my question, I put a question mark on the end of it, is uh, how can you measure these, <laughs> these intangibles? I mean, is, it, is there some uh, proxy for them? Yeah, I mean, the, the measurement, the issue of how to measure success is, 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 a, is a debate of its own. And there are so many, I mean, we try to discuss productivity growth as such and, and use long-term data to be able to, to see trends. Uh, and there's many, many ways of measuring success. And Tyler is mentioning a few innovations that I absolutely agree with that we don't even discuss in that sense in, in the book, which are, they're absolutely true. And what you say too is also absolutely true. Um, but to go back to you know, the general fundamentals of the economy, I think anyway, looking at TFP, uh, total factor productivity growth and, 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 and measurements like that is, is the only way to try to grasp, even if they're not complete, even if you can always argue for something else, they give us at least an idea where we're heading. And, and we're quite convinced that we unfortunately are right. Let's, let's go right here up front. Hold on, please wait for, please wait for the mic. John Soliday, Economist. Does measurement error, has measurement error caused you to underestimate innovation? And I'm, I'm thinking just of the entertainment people can do on their computers, the, the infinite movies, I mean, and, and shopping without plugging Amazon. I mean, it's, these are massive kinds of changes and, yeah. and happiness thing, matching. Have, well, you, have you underestimated it? 
Well, I'm, I'm sure we have. I'm, I'm sure sort of all... Does that affect your conclusion? No, it doesn't. I mean, I, I, because I'm, I'm sure we underestimated them on, in previous parts of history as well. And I think you can make a very strong case for that. Many of the sort of unmeasured, cha unmeasured changes that happen in life was actually stronger 40, 50, 100 years ago than they are today. Um, and that sort of applies to a lot of the environmental sort of changes that have happened for the good as well, that sort of look at sort of the sort of consumer surplus in healthcare and many other fields. Um, I don't think the question is so much about do we measure things sort of in a good way today or not. I think there's an obvious answer, which is no, we don't. We, we, sort of, we, we, we can't find the answer to them. I think it's, for me at least, is that I think, I think there's a stronger case for technology changing lives for the better and innovation changing lives for the better uh, in ways that weren't captured by statistics more in the past than happens now. And we need a good theory of the aggregate su consumer surplus, but that's the d difficult part of the demand curve to, to, to estimate up there. Yeah. Penicillin uh, was never expensive, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's right. Yeah. Let's go uh, right here. Yeah. Please, please, wait, please wait for Mike. Yeah. Indra Goklani. I wrote a book called The Improving State of the World Once Upon a Time. Uh, not improving once upon a time, but the improving state of the world, sorry. I also wrote a book called The Precautionary Principle. Yes. And because of those- Do you like it? Uh, pardon? Do you like The Precautionary Principle? Actually, I think The Precautionary Principle can be used to good effect, but it has almost never done that way. Mm. I totally agree with your uh, comments on that. And actually, that's why I found your comments so interesting. It seems to me that there's been a lot of innovation. Unfortunately, it's been in the rent-seeking and regulatory spheres. And the precautionary principles are a perfect example of that. And it used to be in the past, we would do things without being 100% sure. And these days, it's virtually impossible to do that. And I think that is one of the reasons why, uh, why uh, uh, economic development and uh, growth has been retarded. And I think, and the thing is that it's not in just one place. It's been picked up almost across the globe. Mm -hmm. So what's happened now is you have a situation where capital is probably not going to the best spot where people, where capitalists would want it to go, but what you have are second and third best places where they're going to. Because you cannot, for example, who in his right mind would have uh, this Keystone Pipeline? Anybody in his, uh, at any group in the right mind would have given, it, given up years ago. There must have been some real big-headed guy who in insisted that would go on for years and years and years. And I think because of that, you should not be surprised if things are, reti uh, are retarded. Having said that, I tend to agree with Tyler, Tyler uh, Cowan that there are a lot of invisible innovations out there. And there's no doubt in my mind that life is a whole lot better today than it was, and I don't think uh, and I think it's improved a lot more rapidly around the globe than it had ever done so in the past. All you've got to do is take a look at how life expectancy has ex increased and uh, mortality has de uh, decreased for infants and mothers, etc. cetera. And, and I am totally convinced that none of that is captured and it doesn't matter. It is what it is. I think the real problem is not only that life is better, a lot of people think it's just good enough. And that's where the precaution principle comes in. Now, yeah, may, may I comment on, on one thing? I think that what really is important is perhaps the idea of the future and the, the, the opportunity you have to change your future. I yeah, so if you are in a, if we are right, we are even more and more getting into a situation where more and more people will find that they are stuck. And that is a very dangerous situation. Because if you look at history, People have, have always been entrepreneurial. And before 1776 and onwards, they were entrepreneurial in a very big, different way. We were tribals before, if you go back even further. And we were taking what we wanted in a more brute way, and perhaps not a feminine way. Um, but, you know, so we are unleashing force. If we do, I, I, I truly believe that within humanity and within humans, there is a desire to progress and to evolve. And if we stop that, and, you know, it, it, it's be a pressure that boils in society and some, it's going to, some, something is going to happen. 
And, it's not, and, and that's why I think to channel it into productive economic growth is much smarter than, than to, to have another situation. Let me just add a very quick thing. Um, what we're describing in the book is exactly what you're saying, which is that companies and others, they don't stop investing in innovation, but we see reallocation of where sources are going because of regula regulatory uncertainty that sort of companies, they sort of, they're going to choose the path where they think there is an easy way to commercialization rather than to go the difficult path, which tends to be sort of perhaps more technologically exciting for, for the future. So we have that reallocation. We have a lot of rent seeking around these type of, of, of regulations. Uh, it's just that I find it difficult to square your two points, which is that if this is happening, I also find it difficult to believe that we have sort of creation of a lot more invisible good things, innovation today than we had in the past. Uh, I think sort of what we've seen over the past 50 years is of course a great geographical equalization in terms of life chances and material outcomes which have raised life expectancies and so many other things in different parts of the world. We're not seeing the pace of that change being very impressive in the Western world these days. In fact, in quite many countries, we're seeing going in the opposite direction where stuff like sort of uh, suicide rates, where uh, the longevity of s certain groups of society is actually going down. So it's, it's, the story we're telling is not about the world in itself, it's about the Western societies. Okay, let's do one more question. We're gonna go here to the right, I'm sorry. That's one. Hi, uh, Ryan Bandari, uh, Economic Policy Advisor over at Third Way. My question is also somewhat related to rent seeking. You know, since the Great Recession, we've seen a wave of mergers and acquisitions across many different industries, particularly you know, in finance immediately following the crash. Uh, airline industries recently, which are now more profitable than ever, telecommunications, media, and how that obviously relates to rent seeking is that if you have sort of the oligopolization of industries across the uh, the country, at least in the U.S., what is the real incentive for them to spend a lot of money innovating if they, you know, have already captured so much of a share of a market and it's more profitable for them to just, you know, lobby for certain regulations that'll keep the barriers to entry high or try to put one of their hacks in charge of a federal regulatory agency, things like that. So I'm wondering if you could comment on whether or not you've, I, you briefly mentioned this, but whether or not you think big business is just too big in a lot of areas. Well, they are certainly acting in a rational way. Uh, and if they find that it's, it's uh, the best way forward, everything considered, to, to buy a company instead of inventing themselves and to, to lobby, then they will do that. And they have been doing that uh, since the 1980s. The, the mergers and acquisitions has gone up rapidly because of the reason that it's good business to do that. So when you have these international companies that are in that strong position, they utilize those tools to define the pace of change in the market. It's perfectly rational for all these companies to act the way they do. The problem is that we do not get more cancer drugs, flying cars, or get to the moon fast enough. The pace slows down and the 40-year slowdown is happening. Uh, so uh, they are they're not irrational. I would give them advice to do exactly what they're doing in many cases. It's just that as a society and, and overall, we're losing on it. And, and these two things are not really the same things. Um, I think with that, the, uh, the panel has come to a, a, a sad and still somewhat depressing end. <laughs> um, I want to uh, thank all of you for coming. Um, Jim, Tyler, thank you for uh, coming here to comment on the book uh, and sharing your thoughts. Uh, Frederick and Buren, thank you very much for, for presenting. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you.